So there's loads to do tonight. So um, I'm just going to crack on. Um, we've got a, um, I'm going to screen share with you. Alison, please. Alison? Yep. Yep. You're, you're on. on. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Um, almost left. Right. Uh, okay, so illness, medicines, and vaccines. Um, so this is what's on the syllabus. So there's quite a lot. Um, this part. So signs of good health, good condition. Um, and looking at the horse that you've got in front of you. Um, apply them. Um, taking the horse's temperature, pulse, respiration. Um, contents of first aid cabinet. Methods of worm control and how to do it and the problems caused. Um, ways to administer a wormer, um, uh, vaccinations, um, and ailments that you might see in your horse. So, signs of good health and condition. Who can tell me the signs of health and good signs of health and condition in a horse? Bright eyes and bright coat, like shiny coat. Yeah, yeah very good. Salmon pink, kind of in their mouth. Yep, does anyone know which part of the mouth and where mucous else you might Mucous membranes? The gum. Yeah, so the mucous membranes, which is, as you say, the gum. Um, you'll also, where else will you see mu Isn't mucous membranes? Isn't it inside their eye? Yeah, so the pink bit inside their eye, if you lift up their lids. Um, what else is, um, will you... Appetite. So they what was that? Appetite, so they want to eat their food and they finish it. Yeah, normal appetite, so both um, eating and drinking is normal. Um, temperature. Yeah, temperature normal. What's the normal temperature of a horse? Uh, between, roughly between 37 and 38, isn't it? Does anyone know the correct, the, the more specific answer? 37.5 to 38.5. Yeah, 37.5 to 38.5, so it's slightly higher than our average temperature. Um, and their temperature will change. If it, theirs changes, it's a lot more significant than if we change. So our temperature can fluctuate quite a lot. If theirs goes out of that 37.5 to 38.5, you can, would start worrying quite a bit. Um, what else? Not massively over or underweight. Yeah, good. So good condition. Um, so how do we know if the horse is in good condition? Well, like its ribs are not like, you know, properly poking out. Yeah. Anyone else got an idea as how we know, like what you call perfect condition? How you test with perfect condition? Uh, it's got like a round um, hind legs. Yeah. And quarters. Is yeah. It, you can feel but not see the ribs. Yeah, exactly. So you can feel but not see the ribs. Um, what else are we going to be thinking about when we're thinking about the, um, yeah? Make sure they're not dehydrated. Yeah, and how do you, how do you see whether they're dehydrated or not? It's like pinched, like a loose bit of skin and it should go back down. Yeah, go back down quickly. Any other way we can see their hydration levels? By their wee. Yeah. Yeah, and that's... How much, how much water's water. left on their bucket? Yeah. And the wee point, um, another thing to think about is, are they weeing and pooing normally? Um, so is the colour normal? Is the consistency normal? Is the smell normal? Is the regularity normal? Um, anyone got an idea on how else you might test the horse's hydration levels? Have you heard of the capillary refill test? Yeah. No? Yeah. Okay. So capillary refill test is where you can do it to yourself. Um, you put pressure on and it will go up white and it's however quickly it goes back. So I am not very well hydrated because that took quite a while for my skin to go back to normal color after I put pressure on. Obviously you can't um, do that to a horse that's got hair. So any ideas where you might be able to do the capillary refill fill test on the horse? Their gums? Yeah, their gums. So lift up the tooth, put, put pressure on it for a couple of seconds, and then watch how quickly the blood flows back into it. The more hydrated they are, the thinner their blood will be, and that's why it um, flows back in quicker. Any other ideas? They got white flecks. 
all over their body sometimes. White flecks. Little silver flecks. Sometimes it's okay. Like good health. <laughs> hey, I've never heard of that, but I don't know whether that's just a tail. Okay, yeah, might be. I again not heard of that, but there are lots of different things that come up. Anyone got any other ideas? Their coach should be lying flat. Yeah, coach should be lying flat. Um, and I think the way that Pony Club describes it is the coach shouldn't be starey. So starey is when it's dull and kind of not lying flat. It doesn't mean it's sticking up, but just a bit funny. <laughs> um, any other ideas? Bright eyes. So yeah, like bright eyes, yeah. Anything else? The dropping, so that should be firm. Yeah, so how how firm? Like, how do you know if the droppings are correct? Is it when you drop it and then it, it breaks on impact? Yeah, so as it falls out of the horse, it should come out together and as it hits, fall into little bits. But still, little bits, not just a slush. Anything else? That was disgusting. They should be alert. Yeah, yeah alert. Alert and acting themselves. Okay, so let's have a look at the list I've got. So temperature, pulse, and respiration. So we mentioned temperature, but not pulse and respiration. So what is the pulse and respiration? They're like heartbeats. Yep, so what's, what, which one's what? Let's pulse. do pulse first. What's their pulse? Um, so it's their kind of normal heart rate. Yep, so um, how do you find out the horse's pulse? Um, is it a stethoscope behind the elbow? You could use a stethoscope under, yeah. under their jaw. Yeah, so the other thing to do is to put your fingers, because not all of us have a stethoscope, um, under their jaw or where you, wherever you can find a projecting, um, I think it's artery. Um, so you can find them on the shoulder or over a joint, but the easiest one is on the jaw. and feel the number of um, beats. You normally count it for 15 seconds and then times it by four. Um, what's the normal um, pulse of a horse at rest? Uh, 26 to 42. Yeah, around that. And everywhere says different things, but it's around that area. Um, and your horse will be different. Um, bigger horses will have um, different pulse to a smaller horse, fatter horse is different to a thin horse, um, everything like that. Also the fitness of the horse will change um, its pulse. What about respiration? How do you test that? Can you just put a hand like in front of their nostril? Yep, so you can either feel their breaths or you can watch their flanks as they go out and back in. And what's the normal res um, respiration rate for a horse? Well, 10 to 24. Uh, it's 8 to 12 normally, so it's a lot lower than you would think, um, and again, dependent on all the same things. So, pink, salmon pink mucous membranes, we said, capillary refill time, bright eyes, normal droppings in urine, no visible injury, so that's quite an obvious one that no one thought of, so just keep that in your head. Uh, and the same thing, soundness, no visible lameness, so there's not physically, like, really obviously something wrong with them. Um, no excess or odd coloured mucus, so lots of mucus coming from the nose or the eyes. Um, what colour mucus would you not be worried about? Clear. Yeah, um, and also it would be clear and coming from one nostril would be okay. Um, but anything else is a bit worrying. Um, hydration we talked about, normal behaviour, normal gut sounds. So what's the normal gut sound of your horse? Any, anyone ever put their ear to their horse's stomach and listened? There's just like a constant quiet grumbling. Um, does anyone know why that's important to think, to know? Like digestion? Yeah, digestion, which then leads to, can lead to colic. So a horse that's colicking um, will have a silent gut. Um, so that's why you can listen to that. Eating and drinking normally, no excess sweating. Um, so that's another big one. If it's not a hot day or they've not just finished exercising, they shouldn't be sweating. And if they are, there's probably something wrong. And again, we've not got it on here, but no unnecessary shivering. So again, if your horse is shivering um, and it's not cold, then there might be a problem. Um, coat line normally and not look dull or starey. 
and body condition, which talks about the weight of the horse. Okay, so this is mucous membranes. Here you can see. So in the first picture, it's the mucous membranes in the eye. Um, and as I said there, the other way you're going to know if they're hydrated, it should be moist in there. Um, mucous membrane in the mouth, and then they're doing the capillary refill test on the right-hand side one. So do you think this is the right colour? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's about right. Um, which of these pictures is the right colour, which is wrong? The one on the left. The left. Yeah. It's and right. then if you're on the right, there's something very wrong with them. There are some gross photos coming up, so just not too gross, but a bit. A bit. Um, what do we think about these eyes? The bottom right looks all right. I mean, it's a bit weepy, but um, yeah. the other two aren't very good. Would you call the vet for any of these? Yeah, the top, top right. Definitely the top. Which ones? Top right. Would you call about the left hand one? Yeah. Yeah. It depends how if it only happened like once and then it was like fine for a week, but if it continually was bad. Yeah. 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 For what I would do if I had the left hand one, because eyes are so sensitive, I would probably contact my vet, think what they suggested, wash it out with a saline solution. And as you say, if it got worse, that could be caused by a seed in the eye. If it was coming out of both eyes, then I'd call the vet. If it's just that one eye, see whether it gets any better. It's quite hard to see the colour of the mucus. But one thing to think about with eyes, if your horse goes blind, it's never going to gain its eyesight again. So it's better to be safe and sorry with eyes. As you say, the bottom right one, um, it's clear. It's just a little bit. Um, clean it out, keep an eye on it. And if it gets worse, then contact the vet. But like that, you wouldn't be too worried. As you say, it's probably just a little bit of irritation. What about these? Are these okay? Which ones are like? Are these okay? Are these not okay? One on the right. The left's okay, but the right isn't. The right's yeah. not. Yeah, I agree. The right's not. The left is okay, not ideal. You'd probably want to keep an eye on it, um, just because both nostrils are a bit crusty. Um, but yeah, not too much of a worry, and it's reasonably clear. So top left there is a hydration test, the pinch test. Um, and bottom right is just an example of a horse that just looks a little bit dull in its coat um, a little and just looks a bit off um, its eyes its positioning um, so this is conditioning condition scoring quickly so you've got this is zero to five there's different ones some are one to five some are one to nine some are zero to eight um, but this is quite a good one so condition score zero is a is basically starved. So that's, they're just bones. You can't see any muscle, any fat. Condition score one is poor, so it's not much better, but there is a little bit of weight on there. Um, two is moderate. So again, pretty skinny. You can see all the ribs, um, but you wouldn't be calling RSPCA on that one. You're just trying to feed it up. Three is good, as we said. Four is fat. So that's when you start getting the heart shape on the bum. Um, so you want it round, not going up. Um, and you probably wouldn't be able to feel that horse's ribs. And then five is obese. So you're starting to get proper lumps of fat around his body, very round bum, crusty neck, that type of thing. Um, what is the, what's the problems with your horse being the wrong way? No. With them being fat. Yeah, um, it's hard work for them, like to like walk and to breathe. So yeah, there's like more chance of like a heart attack or something. Yeah, and if they're too skinny, if it's for example winter, um, they could get very obviously cold and keep yeah. losing weight. Yeah, uh, and another thing to think about is that overweight is going to put excess strain on joints and um and um muscles and bones because um, there's an extra impact if they're too skinny they're not going to have any energy or fat stores to to um, build more muscle or to do what's required of them um so here is just an actual like proper example can you see all the pictures with the little with the thing on in the way yeah yeah, yeah. so here is just a zero three to five so you've got the one top left is zero so he's got absolutely no muscle. He's completely skin and bones. Um, you'd be very worried about him. Um, middle top, 
um, paw. So again, you can see there's a proper dip in his bum. You can see all his ribs. He's not in good condition, but you can just see from his expression, he's a bit of a happier horse. Top right, um, you can see, still see his ribs and there's no fat covering the muscles um, with, on his bum and it's not quite rounded. So again, that's just a little bit underweight. Bottom left is perfect condition. Um, middle left is overweight. So he's a bit big, he's all right, um, but he is overweight. And bottom right is very overweight, um, very unhealthy. Um, so this is your TPR. Um, so again, there's changes in it. Everyone says different, but this is, temperature is always 37.5, 38.5. Pulse and rep respiration, people have a bit of a variance on, but if you're around that ballpark figure, um, that's okay. Um, make sure you know the TPR of your horse because every horse will be different um, and your horse might naturally have a low temperature um, and it's really important you know that so that if you have a problem and your vet comes out and takes the temperature and it's, it looks low but actually you know it's normal, you can say, oh, actually, that's what it is normally. Um, and same with pulse and respiration. You need to know what's normal so that if something's wrong, you can tell. Okay, what would we have in our first aid kit? Uh, cotton wool, yeah. taking out wounds, vet wrap. Yeah. A hoop bag. Yeah, why would we have a hoop bag? Yeah, poultice. What different poultices can we have? Uh, wet one and a dry one. Yeah, wet and dry. And you can also have a brand mash poultice or just a vet, like a ready-made poultice. Um, does anyone know how to do a poultice? Yeah. How would you do a poultice? Where would you use a poultice? Why would you use a poultice? Um, to, to draw out kind of anything that, so it doesn't get infected. Yeah, to draw out any gunk. So where where is the most common place that you use a poultice? The mm -hmm. well, foot. Yeah, the foot, um, as you say, because normally a wound on the foot is going to be a puncture wound um, and it's also very hard to keep clean. Um, so how would you do a poultice then? Let's say a wet poultice. You would soak it in kind of warm water, but not too hot. Mm -hmm. But it needs to be sterile. Um, so how would you make it sterile? Uh, I'd boil the kettle and yeah, use hot water and then let it cool down. Would you put anything in the water to help with the sterilisation? You could use heavy scrub. Right. Uh, yeah, you could. For a poultice, I'd say it'd probably be better to use just salt. Oh, okay. Um, so just a little bit of salt in the hot water just to make it saline um, and that shouldn't irritate the horse. As you say, so you've soaked it in the water, then what will you do? Um, well, you before you soak it, you probably want to cut it to the right shape, um, yeah. obviously. And then I would put it on and then put uh, cotton wool over the top, ha uh, having squeezed out some of the water so it's not like dripping wet. Yeah. Um, and then you would, after the cotton wool, you'd want to vet wrap it to keep it on. Yeah. You might want to put um, like, like a bit of feed bag over before you put the vet wrap on just to keep the moisture in. Um, how long will you leave the poultice on for? It depends on the horse. If they're really prone to taking them off, you might be inclined to leave it on for a little bit longer. But kind of no more than you probably want to change it every morning and night. Okay. Yeah, you can do up to twenty four hours, but as you say, if you've got a horse that's got a very pussy foot or a pussy wound, you'll want to change it more often to get something clean on there. Okay, what else will we want in our first aid kit? A thermometer. Yeah, good. Very important. gel. Yeah, good. And antibacterial as well. What will you want the, um, to use with the, along with side the thermometer? Vaseline. Yeah, Vaseline. So you have a tub of Vaseline so that 
um, it goes in easier. Um, what else might you use Vaseline for? Their lips, like if they've got dry lips. Yeah, you can do. Rubs from that bit or bridal. Yeah, rubs. Um, and basically anytime you need to use, it's quite a good um, barrier. So if the horse has got a cut that's reasonably healed over, it's not sore at all anymore, um, and you want to turn it out, you can put that on it and it, the flies can't get to it. What else might you have in your first aid kit? Scissors. Yep. Yeah. Um, and ideally blunt ended scissors, so they're not going to hurt the horse. What else? Like a bucket and a clean sponge. Yeah, clean bucket. I'd say probably not a sponge, um, because a sponge isn't a, is holds the dirt and holds any infections. Um, you can never really get a sponge clean unless it's brand new. So um, always stick to your cotton wool for cleaning the wounds. But yes, as you say, a clean bucket. Maybe like purple spray or I can't remember what the proper name, but the white powder that like dries cuts out. Yeah, purple spray, or it's, that's all the antiseptic, antibacterial products. Um, we mentioned before, heavy scrub and salt for cleaning wounds out. Um, so that's very important. Anything else we can think of? Honey? Pardon? Honey? Uh, yeah, you can have honey. What's honey good for? Like helping it a wound to heal faster. Yeah, do you know which type of honey? It's a specific type. Manuka. Yeah, Manuka honey. Um, and you can buy that just from a supermarket. Um, and yeah, as you say, it helps a wound heal faster. So that's quite good on, again, cuts around the mouth. Anything else? Chamomile? Never heard of that one. What might you use chamomile for? I don't know. I just know that it's like really good for, it's good for keeping things, like it makes it less irritant, I think. Um, might be completely right. I've never heard of it, but. Certainly, we use it on dogs, um, right. and I've used it a couple of times. So. That'd be an interesting to, thing to look up and then let us know next time what it yeah. says on okay. it. Um, anything else you can think of? What are you going to put if you have your, you've got a cut on the leg, you're going to bandage it up, what do you need? Gamgee. Gamgee, yeah, very good. Um, so, Gamgee or G. Um, So... Cotton wool, um, as we said, so that's for cleaning wounds out. Antibacterial scrub, hippie scrub or salt. Gamgee or 5G, a, polter, a poultice. Um, and a bran mash, how you do that if you're making a bran mash poultice is bran is like this, I can't really describe it, slightly powdery, slightly textured thing that people used to feed their horses. And you can get a cup of that, mix it with hot water and it makes this brown mush, and you basically fill the hoof in with that, then put um, your bit of um, your bit of feed bag over the top and then wrap it. Um, antiseptic wound cleaner or clear, clear wound gel. Um, sterile dress, dressing, so um, it's good to have small bits of dressing that you can put on the wound before you put your gamgee on. Um, Vaseline, um, bandages, um, such as vet wrap, scissors. So again, round ended are good. Um, and as I said here, make sure they're only used for first aid so they don't get dirty. Um, a clean towel to dry off anything before you put the bandage on. A thermometer. Duct tape, why might you need duct tape? Keep um, that wrap on. Yeah, particularly around the foot or the hoof. Um, Torch, why might you need a torch? To get a better look at something. Yeah, to get a better look, or if it's dark, you might not have lights in your stables. Um, tweezers, why might you want a tweezer? In case you need to pull something small out. Yeah, like splinters or um, things like that out, and a clean bucket, as we said. So really important, you got a fully stocked first aid kit, and every time you use something, you replace it. Okay, so on to worms. So these are five main types of worms we think about. So the small red worms, um, they affect the intestinal tissues. Um, large red worms affect the walls of the arteries. Um, tapeworms can cause polyp and ulcers. Round words, 
that's meant to say blocks the intestine, not blobs. Um, roundworms are more common in horses for, for in horses or foals that are four years old or younger because their intestines are smaller, so they're more likely to block it. Um, and the bots affect the digest digestive system. So how generally do worms spread? If you don't poop pick your field, they like go onto the grass and then the horses eat it. Yeah, uh, horses eat it, goes down into wherever it's going to affect them. They breed, poos out, some of them stay in burrow, some get pooed out, then they go onto the grass, they crawl to the top of the grass and they get eaten again. Um, the exception is bots, because um, bots are actually a type of fly rather than a type of worm. Um, and what happens with bots is um, they'll land on the horse's muzzle or their leg, um, the horse will lick it off, um, it will then stay in the gums for a little bit of time, then go down into the stomach, like the stomach. Um, so worms, if they're not caught early enough, can cause severe damage. They can cause holes in the, intest in the intestine. They, um, as that says, the large red worms um, affects the walls of the arteries. So any um, problems in the arteries is going to be very severe. Um, tate worms, colic and ulcers. Um, they can be very, very serious if they're not um, controlled and they can also make the horse lose weight. So worm control. As someone already said, poop it regularly. So if you can every day, if you can't, you should be trying to do it at least twice a week, absolute minimum once a week. Um, and the other thing that's recommended is that you target, target worms specifically. So you make sure you're worming for the correct worm for the correct time of year, if that makes sense. Um, you worm all of the horses on the yard at the same time because there's no point worming your horse um, and the horse next door to it not being wormed because it's not going to kill all the worms um, and your, that horse next door could just give you your horse worms again. Um, so egg counts with saliva or poo. Why is this really good and why is this method becoming more and more used? Because it avoids unnecessary kind of vaccinations and everything. Yeah, so they can not get like immune to the wormer. Yeah, so they can get the worms can get immune to the wormer. So by doing saliva or poo samples, um, you're making sure you can test whether your horse actually needs wormer um, and what it needs the wormer for. So it's a very good way of doing it. The downside is it can be expensive if you've got a lot to do. Um, obviously, worm control by worming. Um, cross grazing. Does anyone know what I mean by cross grazing? Only let certain, yeah. certain paddocks, or like make sure that you're moving them around. So if one one paddock's got like loads of worms, and they get to move out there like quite quickly. That's a good point, but not quite. When we think about cross grazing, anyone got any other ideas? Is it like you have one horse in one field, and then you bring another horse in? Again, good guess, but not quite. Any ideas? Is it if you have like cows and sheep? Yeah. Well. Yeah, so cross grazing is grazing sheep and cows on the grass as well as your horses. <coughs> um, the reason this is good is cows and sheep um, are affected by different worms the horses are. So horses are immune to the sheep worms and sheep immune to the horse worms, if that makes sense. Um, so it's quite a good, like if you're resting your fields, put a couple of sheep on them and they'll get rid of worms. Um, enough grazing as well, because if your horse hasn't got as much grazing, they're going to be picking around more. Um, and if there isn't enough grazing, you might want to poop it more regularly. Um, and then the other thing is, worm all new arrivals, regardless of when it is, um, for red worm and tape worm, because you don't know how strict they used, they were uh, with worm controlling at a previous yard. So it's really important that as they come in, you make sure that they are free of worms and you don't turn them out until they've been wormed and they've had their 24 hours to get everything out of the system. Okay, so how to worm. Really important that you weigh your horse first. So either with a weigh bridge or with a tape. If it's a tape, um, the recommendation is that you add 10% on because it's not 100% accurate. Um, and if you're using a syringe, you want to lift the horse's head up until it swallows. Um, so that it doesn't spit anything out. And another 
point is that young horses aren't as immune as older horses. Um, so they're more likely to get worms. Okay, so what's in, these are, you don't need to know into this in this much detail, but these are what's in a wormer. So these are the key ingredients. So moxidectin, um, as you can see, so that um, is good against the red, wor red worms, pin worms, thread worms, um, and bots. Ivermectin, um, effective against red worms, small red worms, pin worms, thread worms, stomach worms, lung worms, um, ascarids, and bots again. Um, Parantal, round worms, um, praziquantil. Um, it's that's ones for tapeworm um, and fembedazol um, isn't as common as you can see, but it's for small red worm. Um, it's worth just making a note of these and having a couple of them in your head um, and a couple of them just know. I would recommend the ivermectin and the praziquantil. Um, they're one of the they're two more commonly known ones and just have them and which worms they attack in the back of your head when you go into the test um, because they do ask you about that. Um, so this is just a rough worm plan that you would think about following. So autumn, September, October, carry out a saliva test for tapeworm. So September and October, you're thinking about tapeworm. Um, and if it comes back positive, you want a wormer um, containing praziquantil. Um, so again, that's why I said praziquantil is quite a good one to think about. Um, so a very common one is the Acrest Pramox. Um, and again, just um, have it in your head. You don't need to know all of these wormers, just pick one and say that's the one you use. Um, winter, so November through to February. Um, small red worm. Um, and butt fly. Um, so Ecrest, which is a single dose, or the oh, Panacure Equine, which is a five day course. The five day course is normally um, better for horses that won't take the syringe because it normally comes in um, like granule form, you can put it in their feed. Um, March, April, test again for tapeworm. Um, and again, it's your Praziquantil. Um, so same the Crest Pramox or Ecmax, um, and then May August worm count again, and Panicure Equine again is quite a commonly known one. So it's a bit of a horrible thing to look at, and this is quite a boring part of the B test because it is just words that you slightly have to learn. Um, and there's no way you're not, they're not easy words to remember. So it's just a matter of look, making a plan, writing it out in whichever way is easiest for you um, and remembering as much of it as you can. Um, why is it important to follow a worm plan? So you don't do it too often and make them immune to the um, wormers? Yeah, and also to make sure you're worming for the correct worm. Um, so yeah, make sure you have your worm plan because they'll ask you what's your worm plan um, for your horse. Um, and again, this is different ways to worm. Some horses won't take a syringe. So most common is in a syringe. Um, you can use granules, which you put in the feed. Tablets, again, you put in the feed. Um, you can put the syringe in the feed. I wouldn't recommend that because it's not designed to be fed that way, but that is an option. Um, you can also feed it on the bit. So I syringe one of my horses onto the bit and then put the bit in the horse's mouth and leave it in the mouth for a while um, for him to lick and chew because he won't let me in there with a syringe. Um, how might you feed, just in general, medicine or wormer from a from a feed, how will you encourage them to eat it? You try to take taste away so they can't really taste it. Yeah, and any ways you might be able to do this? 
put like carrots and apples in it. Yeah. Something sweet. Um, really common one is apple juice. Um, so you pour some apple juice in there and it's quite strong. Um, it will cover up the smell and it will taste like apples. So they tend to like it. So apple juice is quite a good one. Um, also make, try and make it a smallish feed um, so that there's not too much of it. Um, and it's that type of thing. Okay, again, not very fun, but vaccinations. So why do you vaccinate your horse? So there we go. Not just about your horse, it's about all horses. So if you don't vaccinate your horse, your horse might not be affected, but it might your horse then might be a carrier or something like that um, and cause another horse to catch something. Protecting your horse from life-threatening diseases, um, really important. Another one, you can't compete without vaccinations, so you might as well get them. Um, and then just you might invalidate your insurance policy if you don't have up-to-date vaccinations. Um, if your horse falls ill with something and you've not vaccinated against it, um, that's your fault, not your insurers, so you won't be liable. Um, they won't be liable, you'll be li no, liable. Um, vaccinating your horse won't make it unwell. A lot of people say that it will, it won't. It might make them stiff for a day or two, um, but it won't make them ill. Um, and as I say, it's good value for money. It's cheaper to vaccinate your horse than to treat your horse for tetanus. Um, so what do you vaccinate for? I just didn't want them. Flu. Flu and tet. And there's one more you can vaccinate for. Um, it's been talked about quite a lot in about the last year and a half, but most people don't vaccinate against it. Racehorses do. Rabies? Same as, is it the same as equine influenza or is that the same thing? No, equine influenza is flu, not rabies. It's um, equine herpes, basically, um, which is a very, very fatal um, disease, which could basically um, attack horses' nervous system and can paralyze them. Um, and it's quite infectious as well. So that's the only one that can um, cause a risk by inject it, by vaccinating, which is why a lot of people don't. It's also quite a low chance your horse will get it. Um, but if your horse travels a lot, um, then it's probably quite a good one to get. So how often should you vaccinate? So tetanus, you don't need to read that. Primary course, um, first one, um, and then four to six weeks later, another one, and then a booster in 12 months. How often should you then get your horse vaccinated? Every two years. Yeah, so with tetanus every two years. Um, what about equine flu? It says here, so initial is three injections. Um, and this is done with days. So again, write it down these days, try and remember them. Between 21 and 92 days. Um, then 150 days and then 250 days. Um, and how regularly should you do flu? Every six months. So every six months if you're competing, um, at the moment it's a bit different because of coronavirus, but check your, whoever you're competing with rules. Um, but if you're not competing, it's just, it's annually. Um, if you are competing, it's, either every six months or within six months of your competition. And um, as it says there, flu and tap jabs are normally the same. So although you don't need to get your horse um, done for tetanus and every year, um, you normally do it as a combined vaccine. Um, and if you miss one of your years, you have to completely restart the course again with the three initial injections or the two initial injections. So really important that you don't miss them. Um, and as you said, if you're competing, often it's six months, so worth thinking about. Um, where is it recorded when they've had their vaccinations? In their passport. Yeah, and why, um, why, is it, why does a horse need to be with its passport at all times? So if you, your horse is at a livery yard, why is the, does the passport need to be at the livery yard? If your horse is travelling, why should the passport be in the lorry? Is it so that if something was to happen to them, they can see when they had their last jab or? Yeah, so partly if something was to happen. Secondly, to check that you're not stealing the horse. 
So the passport will either have the microchip number or it will have all the horse's markings um, and whirls and everything in it. So you could be pulled over um, and someone could check, are you stealing this horse? And if you've got the passport, you can prove that you're not. It will also say, it should say your owner's name, the owner's name in there. And if you can prove yourself as the owner, then that's no problem. Okay, so we're just gonna quickly talk about these common problems in your horses. So my wounds, colic, strangles, laminitis, tying up. How would you, um, what would you describe a minor wound as being? So not a major, just a minor. Like a graze. Or a graze. Yeah, cut or a graze. Doesn't need stitching, isn't around a joint, because if it's around a joint and it does get infected, it can cause big problems for the joint. Um, blood isn't pumping out of it because that would suggest there's an artery has been hit. Um, if it's not a puncture wound, so the puncture wound is quite a major wound. Um, and it's not a wound in the hoof or the eye because um, that again can cause lots of problems later on. Okay, so what symptoms is this horse showing? Colic. Colic. Yeah. Good. So, what are the Causes of, comp of colic, the symptoms of colic, the treatment of colic. Well, they like, kick their stomach all the time. That's a symptom. Uh, that's just like sign of it. Yep, kick no, or bite. Try to roll or lie down. Yep. And they just, sometimes they just don't seem like themselves. Yep. Yeah, they just look unwell. Yeah. Um, they could be their stomach will be quiet if you listen to their stomach. Um, they might not be drinking and eating normally. Normal signs of good health will go out the window. Um, the other one with colic is they will probably be ex excessively sweating. Um, it's quite a stressful and a very painful experience for them. Um, so here, yeah, so causes of colic. Um, the wrong diet. Um, colic is when um, it's a basically it's impaction in their intestine or in their stomach. So it's when the food gets stuck, it causes a blockage and the horse can't throw up. Um, and if they can't get it to go out, it just gets completely stop, stuck. In very severe cases, it can cause the stomach to twist, which is when it then needs to be operated on. Um, so low forage, which is not enough hay and haylage. So it's the missing fiber, because the fiber is what keeps the stomach going. Um, if you've not got enough fiber, then there's an increased chance of colic. Um, moldy feed, because it won't be going through correctly. An abrupt change in feed because the stomach's not going to be prepared for it. Um, parasite infestation. Lack of water. So again, if everything's too dry, it's not going to go through and it's going to get stuck. Um, sand ingestion. So they can get sand colic. So if they are drinking out of a sandy bucket, a very sandy bucket, or they're eating a lot of sand, they can get colic. Um, we won't look at the SNAIDS. But stress, if they're highly stressed, it can cause colic. Um, and dental problems, because it means they might not be chewing their food correctly. Um, so the bits will be too big and they might get stuck. So as we've said, the signs are pouring the ground, kicking the ground, rolling, if they're bloated, sweating, being distressed, uneasiness, not interested in food and water, sitting weirdly or sounding weirdly, um, and absence of gut sounds. And that's one of the first things your vet will do when it comes out, if your horse is being safe enough, is listen to the gut. Um, would you call your vet for colic? Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah as you say, it can, if not caught early, it can be very serious. Um, and who knows what the, the vet might do if your horse does have colic? Keep them standing up. Yeah. For however long. Yeah. What else? They will probably stick their arm up the horse's butt um, to try and find where the blockage is. And some colics can be prevented by doing that and actually dislodging it themselves. Um, if it's very serious, they might want to operate. Um, they can, if it might be hydration, they can increase the hydration in the horse. Um, so they can tube water in to help flush it through um, but they'll also just be able to help you manage it because it's quite a scary situation so as you say you would call a vet if it's got colic um, if your horse has colic surgery um, 
are the chances of survival high or low? No, not great. They're not, yeah, they're not low, low, but they're not great. Um, they, a vet will avoid colic surgery at all costs um, because the surgery might go well, but with a colicking horse, um, it's likely to recolic after surgery. And if it recolics, it won't be able to operate again. Um, and also operating on a horse that severely, there's quite an increased chance that the horse will break a leg getting up from the surgery. So they will avoid operating at all costs. Um, operating on colic is also very, very expensive. Um, but so as you say, call the vet out as soon as you notice it and try and get them to stop it. Will you still allow your horse to eat food? Yeah, I'd encourage it to eat. Any other ideas? I swear you give it nothing until the vet's there. Yeah, yeah take away food and water until the vet's, where, vet's there. Try and keep it standing unless it's dangerous. Make sure you've got your hat on um, and anyone in there with you has their hat on um, because of course, if it's in that much distress, it can become out of character and aggressive. Um, and it might accidentally kick you while trying to kick itself. Um, okay, what symptoms is this showing here? Not sure. Not quite, no. Strangles? Yeah, so this is what strangles looks like. It is. Is it strangles? Yeah, so it's that lump, that swollen lymph nodes that you can see um, back here, basically, um, and excessive discharge from both the nose and the eyes of the horse has got strangles. Um, so it causes the strangles, it's oral and nasal roots, um, direct core, from direct contact, um, or indirect. So this is why it's so contagious is because it can be caught really easily. So feed, water, bedding, stables, stable utensils, vehicles, everything like that. So as it says, biosecurity is really important. So the signs of strangles, rapid onset of a high temperature. So as you can see that normal is 37 to 38.5. If it goes one degree above normal, um, a big problem, loss of appetite, yellowish discharge from the nostrils, um, and the big sign is the enlarged glands. So as you can see from that photo of that young horse, um, very obvious lumps here. They can be smaller as they're coming on, but can be that severe. Um, coughing and difficulty swallowing because of the swelling, they won't be able to swallow very well. Um, so treatment, horses need to immediately be isolated. And when you're isolating a horse, your biosecurity is good. So with biosecurity, what it means is for that horse to stable, you use a different wheelbarrow, a different fork, a different broom. Um, you disinfect everything. You wear a full different um, outfit. So either a suit or you change what you're wearing when you go from that horse to somewhere else. Because if that horse coughs while you're in the stable and a bit gets in your hair and then you go into another stable and the horse nuzzles your head and you forget about it, then that horse has strangles. Um, and it can be, um, it can cause death. It's quite, um, there's quite a high chance that the horse won't survive strangles. Um, but the other issue is it is so easily spread. Um, and they can hold the infection for six to eight weeks, which is why you isolate them for that. Um, and as it says, when it's not severe, it's supportive therapy, therapy. So call your vet. Always call your vet with strangles, partly because they need to know. If they've treated your horse in the last six weeks, they need to be aware that other horses they then treated on that day may have caught something. Um, so anti-inflammatory is to get those hands down and isolation. Antibiotics might help. Um, and treating the abs abscesses once they burst. So those abscesses, they don't go down, they pop um, and a lot of fluid runs out. Um, if it's severe, they're gonna have to have a lot more vet treatment. Um, they may not survive it if it's severe. There's quite a low chance of that. What is the, are these photos showing? Laminitis. Yeah, so who can tell me what laminitis is? 
Um, is it when like the bone goes down? Yes. Yeah, so that's really severe. The lamini swell up. So does anyone know what the lamini is? Um, it's oh, yeah. Yeah, it's like a feathery bit of the hoof. It's lots and lots of little lines, and if they swell up, they cause a lot of pressure, particularly at the front of the hoof, which causes the pedal bone. So the pressure comes from, this is the hoof, this is the pedal bone, the lamina's here, the pressure, it swells up, it pushes the pedal bone down, and as you say, in very severe cases, it can go through the bottom of the hoof. Um, the ho uh, yeah, at that point, Again, this is getting really depressing. If the pedal bone goes through the hoof, there's no solution. It's going to have to be put down, which is why it's really important to catch laminitis early on. So there was a lot on laminitis. Um, I'm just going to quickly run through it. Don't try and read it all. <laughs> yeah. So laminitis um, can be caused by too much food, particularly high, um, high energy, so too much like grain too many carrots too many apples that type of thing very high fight high rich grass um particularly if it's suddenly so if you've rested a field and you suddenly turn your horse out in it um and it's got really good grass it might get laminitis um if it's ill could have laminitis from being ill um very bad colic can cause laminitis um mares may get it from retained placenta um Excessive concussion to the feet, to the feet, so too much road work, probably without horses having shoes on, um, and it will be, and there will be that con concussion, um, and similar to that, excessive weight bearing on one leg or another, potentially due to an injury, um, other foot diseases, which could then cause laminitis, um, and your horse is at an increased risk if it's a heavy breed, so a draft horse or a very big cob increased risk risk if the horse is overweight um or the horse has a lot of carbohydrate rich meals ponies miniature horses and donkeys are more at risk of laminitis um and your horse is going to be more at risk of laminitis if it breaks into the feed room if it breaks into the feed room don't wait until symptoms show call the vet so that something can be done before the laminitis will happen um, a horse that's had laminitis is more likely to get it again, um, and a horse with Cushing's disease is more likely to get laminitis. So the signs are lameness, um, heat in the feet, increased pulse in the feet, um, pain in the toe re region. So if your vet comes out and uses hoof testers or your farrier uses hoof testers and pinches the toe, there'll be pain. Um, hesitant gait, so walking on egg eggshells. Um, and then stood, like we can see there, stood backwards, trying to take the weight off the front of the feet and stand on their heels. Um, signs of chronic laminitis, so that's laminite, basically a horse that has suffered with laminitis for a long time, is rings in the hoof wall. So that one bottom right there, you can see the rings, that's more chronic laminitis. Um, bruised soles, so they stand on their soles more than their toes and that causes a bruise. Wide and white line, dropped soles or flat feet. Again, they're putting more weight on their heels. Uh, a cresty neck without being overweight in other places. Um, and dish tubes, which again is that curving up at the front, which is so common with laminitis. Um, treatment, again, really important to catch quickly. Um, but a lot of it will be figuring out what the problem was. It Was it diet? Was it weight? Um, was it concussion and then doing something about it um so again it's quite a vague thing the treatment because it depends on what the cause was but a lot of the causes are overweight or too much grass so take the horse off of that cut its feed down um get the advice of your vet or a nutritionist as to what to do um you can also ask your farrier to give you help so things can um, help with laminitis such as specific trimming, support in different places and that type of thing. There we go, that's some bigger but we've covered that. Um, okay, anyone know what this horse is showing signs of here? Is that... Um, yeah, what was that Audrey? Tying up. Tying up. 
Yeah, tying up. And does anyone know the other word for tying up? Uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's like as a turia. As a turia. As a turia. Yeah, yeah, so who knows what as a turia is? Isn't it when their muscles like um, get really stiff and it's quite sore for the horse? Yeah, it's basically a very severe all body cramp. Um, so it's also known as Monday morning disease. Does anyone know why it got that name? Because of hunting. Hunting, yeah. Hunting and racing, more racing than hunting. So racing or often have Sundays off um, and then go galloping on Mondays. They don't drop the feed on the Sunday, which means the horse does absolutely nothing on the Sunday. Um, there's a buildup of lactic acid and when they go galloping, it causes huge cramp. I'm really running out of time, so I'm going to try and crash through this. So again, overfeeding a horse that doesn't need it. So if your horse has a day off, you should always drop the food, food on that day. Um, it's something that a lot of people don't do. It's think, something you need to think about though. So sudden increase of workload, um, working a horse um, if soon after a period of rest, if you didn't drop the feed down. Um, if they've not got enough electrolytes, so again, if you're about to do some hard work with your horse, it's good to feed your horse electrolytes a couple of days beforehand. Deficiency in vitamins, um, imbalance in hormones, um, wet, cold, windy weather, because if they're cold, they're gonna be tenser, um, they're gonna be holding themselves against it. So again, the signs, stiffness and a shuffling gait. It's really horrible when a horse ties up. They basically, if it's bad, they won't be able to move. Um, poor performance, reluctant to move, severe pain, so sweating, increased pulse and respiration, hard and painful locomotor muscles, so that's particularly their bum and going down their back legs red urine, urine um, and often they won't put weight on their back legs. Treatment is to limit mu muscle damage. So the worse it is, the more the muscle damage, the longer it's going to take for them to recover um, and also to reduce pain. So it's very painful very quickly. So the first thing you would call your vet definitely if your horse tied up, um, they will probably, as you can see, they might do a, a urine test um, prescribe medications. If it's bad, um, the vet may um, immediately um, tube the horse with salty water to um, increase the hydration and also the um, salt levels in the blood um, because, as I said, the horse will be um, normally dehydrated if this happens. Um, the horse will then need some help in recovery because those muscles will be damaged um, if it was bad. Your vet will probably take bloods and get them tested to test how bad the horse tied up um, so that there are different levels in the blood. It's quite complicated, but they'll test that and you can then retest that before you get them back to work to check that the levels are back to normal and back to healthy. If a horse ties up once, it's more likely to tie up again. Okay, we're almost there. Causes of atypical myopathy. So atypical myopathy is caused by a horse eating a sycamore seed. So from those trees. Um, they contain a toxin which slows or stops energy production in muscles and, and, and then the heart. Um, some are more susceptible to the toxins. The sign is weakness, so struggling to walk, stand, breathe. A horse with this will probably be lying flat out in the field and won't get up. Um, the horse might develop heart problems, um, may appear depressed, muscle trembling, signs of severe colic. Um, but they will still have an appetite, dark brown or red urine, um, and they might not be able to stand treatment. Um, again, call the vet. Very serious. Um, you, if your horse is eaten, if your horse has atypical myopathy, it needs to probably go into, as it says there, specialist equine hospital for 24-hour care. Um, a lot of horses won't survive from atypical myopathy um, because it can just basically stop the heart. So again, be really, it's prevention rather than treatment with a lot of these, make sure there's no sycamore any near, where near your horses. Um, and what, what would you call these wounds? Minor wounds? Minor. Yeah, these are all minor wounds. Would you call the vet out for these wounds? No. No. No, the only one you'd watch is top right. Um, make sure it's not affecting the coronet band and therefore affecting hoof growth. Okay, I'm sorry that's been a bit long. I've overrun there. Um, does that all make sense? Does anyone have any questions? 
No. Um, no do you need to know the name of the shoes you can you that you use if your horse is laminitis? The ones with like the bars for your frog, the for, for the frog. Um, you don't need to know it for this section, but I believe you need to know it for foot and shoeing, which I think we're covering next week. Okay. So, um, yes, you need to know it, but for a different section of the B test. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, thanks, my mouse is broken. Okay.